Good morning, here we are, ready with part two. Uh, let's get the arm underway. Here's a piece of 3 8 inch square brass and uh, unlike steel, which is in metric, brass is still in inches. Um, it's just one of those things, so let's cut a 7 inch length of this. Uh, marking out, and of course the most important one is the pivot. Now for the main hole uh, through the arm. sum up, we've uh, replaced the bolts underneath the uh, key by, countersunk, by countersinking them, so that's removed. We've got no problem now about having a sheet of rubber or something, under thin rubber underneath. Uh, <laughs> countersinking them did reduce, slightly reduce the amount of adjustment we had there, but it's still, uh, it's still running very well. The arm has been drilled uh, they're using the same knob that comes from the old key. The backstop is, is there, which is tapped right through, and we're going to use 4BA because it's got a, f you know, the thread is fairly fine to give us some adjustment. The only uh, bad thing at the moment is that the 6mm shaft uh, occupies so much of the width of the, uh, the depth of the arm that there's only a very little bit of thread there in this 6B8 tap uh, to put a little screw in to secure the arm to the shaft uh, but uh, so that is a design that's a drawback but I didn't think of that oh one other thing of course is um, you know why are these uh, bearing blocks so far apart uh, well I mean the answer <laughs> the answer is because the, the bearing blocks on every other Morse key uh, they are close together and I suppose that's so that they support, uh, stop the arm from going like that. Well, um, I wondered what a key would be like with the bearing blocks um, far apart. So this is one, and I'll, we'll see if it makes any difference. Uh, well, we've provisionally uh, you know, assembled the key to see what it looks like. It resembles a Morse key now, but I'm sorry to have to tell you that my marking out was pretty bad because the arm is coming this way. You know, it's uh, skewiffed. Uh, well, I, <laughs> um, that was that was the reason why I said I would wait until the arm was in place before committing us to making any um, contact holes in the bottom plate. I, I, I rather thought it might turn out skewiffed, but uh, never mind. Uh, we've got two little collets we happen to have here to stop it wandering that way. Um, and it now does slightly resemble a Morse key, but as we remarked yesterday, um, the arm is too near the uh, the base for us to get contacts in. So as I, I did mention it, the, the, the bearing blocks have got to be raised up. This is where we're going to have uh, the first front contact. I say the first because we can drill more holes and have them all over the place. I moved it a little bit, it's about a quarter of an inch further forward. Um, but the reason it's lying on the base is my marking out is so awful. <laughs> I, I'm going to hold this bar down and just mark it with a, a, a drill, which has made a, a hole there. So we, we can uh, drill for the bottom contact there. Uh, well, it may not look like it, but we're getting uh, close to the end now. And uh, well, what are we going to use for contacts? Well, that's, uh, that's very simple because a unit which I bought in, at a radio rally and dismantled was a signal generator. It had eight of these tuned circuits in it, the sort of low frequency ones, uh, ranging up to uh, quite high frequency ones. Uh, and each of the eight uh, things, had, uh, uh, panels, had six uh, silver plated contacts on it <laughs> so uh, we're going to use a couple of those 
so we'll just uh, polish them up a bit and um, what's good about them about these things is when you take them off they're actually uh, threaded 6BA means you can screw one straight into the arm so just uh, yes they've come up rather nice and the advantage is uh, that we've drilled this and you can just screw um, the contact into the arm like that so it's pretty neat um, Yes, I'm getting a bit impatient now. I'm just going to solder uh, a wire to one of these contacts. Like so. Rather an unsightly blob of solder, but there we are. Now these are the uh, distance pieces we made to raise the bearing blocks up. Taken off the blue paint, so let's uh, put it together. Yes, the back contact is um, on a fibre washer and there's a little piece of brown um, plastic insulation which is not satisfactory at all, uh, but it just is at the moment an interference fit uh, down there. Um, I haven't got any super glue, or otherwise I would glue it in place. Uh, I've got Bostic, but that would dissolve the plastic, wouldn't it? So, uh, well, it's nearly ready to try. But you will have noticed there is no provision for tensioning uh, on the arm. Um, this is the original arm and the spring, there's the, there's the pivot, there's the backstop and the spring was in between. Well, we could have it there, but I made the arm a bit longer so we could have a spring behind the backstop so we can try out various um, combinations of things. Well, for tensioning, um, I'm just using a single rubber band at the moment, we'll get look into springs later but I, as I say, can't wait uh, to try it and um, that's, that's fairly stiff you can sort of move, move, it, move the elastic band back a bit Well, we'll just have to get a stock of elastic bands. And I also admit that I have temporarily put three rubber feet on because uh, it would, you know, it's staying, sort of staying put. Um, but I would put a sheet of something underneath it eventually. Um, so, well, there we are. And we can drill more holes and have contacts in different places. And, um, well, all we need to do now is have a contact with it. Uh, so why did I want the straight key? Well, I, I normally use this paddle key, a single paddle key by Kent. Um, but um, a few, a couple of weeks ago, I joined a, a radio club called Fists, which is a British-based but worldwide society that promotes the uh, use of Morse code. Well, they don't have to promote it to me because that's what I use virtually all the time. Uh, but I've often heard them on, it's their 25th anniversary this year. And um, so I uh, started to work them, they do rag chewing and they often work at 15, 12, 10, well, any speed. Um, now if it's going to be that speed I prefer a straight key over the puddle. So I got the old one out and found it was all floppy so we've made this. And, um, and it hasn't cost a lot of money, by far the dearest bit of the two bearings, that was eight, eight pounds for the pair of bearings. But the, um, the silver steel is about, you know, this much is about 40 pence. Uh, the, the plate would be about £1.50 and the brass about a pound. So you're talking about 10 or 11 pounds. Um, let me pick whether it's going to be satisfactory or not. That was, I don't know, that was the reason for making it. So I hope it hasn't been too boring. And uh, I must just leave you with reminiscences of um, three very famous uh, radio amateurs. Uh, that had very distinctive uh, calls. Uh, yes, there was a French radio amateur, F3BF, and uh, I would hear him a lot in the 80s when I was very active, uh, calling CQ, and of course he got a very rhythmic call sign. And, uh, of course, 
when you could hear it, you, after a bit, you had to go and work him uh, so that it would stop. I mean, he was actually a very nice guy, a very nice bloke. It was his call sign that was the problem. And the, the, then in the 1930s, there was a missionary um, in Burma, uh, what was then Burma, the prefix was X-ray uniform, and he asked for and was given the call sign XU2UU, and it is said that he sent it all in one, which, if so, it would have been like this. Which was certainly very distinctive. Um, lastly, um, the very, very famous um, amateur VU2BK cab in Pune, retired Indian Army officer, who sent most of his call sign um, together. Uh, but then when he got to the B, he would sort of lengthen the dash of the B and then do the K separately. And um, it, it, I think it went something like this. <laughs> 